Welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. I am uh, taking a, a bold step tonight. I'm going to do this program by myself. I have a lot that I want to talk about. And this is the first time that I've uh, uh, done it by myself without an audience, a live audience. So I'm going to uh, work on this tonight. Be patient with me. Uh, my subject matter tonight is Christianity. I'm going to be talking about Christians tonight. And uh, so you may want to run across the street and, and get your neighbors and your friends and your enemies and tell them to tune in uh, uh, because I'm sure that they will want to hear this. All right. Um, and the reason that I want to talk about Christianity is because and if you notice, I have notes. This is the first time I, I uh, I've used notes and uh, uh, because I like to speak from my heart. But there are some subject matters that I want to make sure that I deal with. But I want to talk about Christianity because um, there are churches on every corner uh, within the black community and other uh, communities, too, but especially the black community. Everybody and their mama go to church. Uh, so we want to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, how you've been made to feel guilty if you don't go to church. Uh, uh, we have been given a guilt trip. I want to talk about that tonight. Is it necessary to feel guilty? And how does this happen? We believe that the church is the temple, temple of the Lord. That is false. Our body is the temple of the Lord. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I've noticed that many, many, if not all, many preachers, teachers, and ministers believe that uh, you have to go to school to be a preacher. If God call you, you now have to go to school and let some man teach you what God has to tell you or what God has uh, uh, want you to tell others. It's not true. And I'm, I'm going to try to show you that tonight. I'm not going to use a lot of uh, Bible, Bible verses on you. I'm not going to quote scriptures to you per se. So you don't have to pull out, pull out your Bible. Just be cool about that. Um, my name is uh, Jesse Peterson, as I said earlier. And I am the uh, founder and president of a national nonprofit organization called the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. We realize that nothing is going to get better. It's not going to change until men come back to order. Uh, no welfare, no affirmative action, no uh, the white man loving us or hating us, uh, no government pro no governmental program, no Maxine Waters, no Jesse Jackson, no NAACP, the Black Caucus, and all of these churches on the corner are not going to save us. All right, it is not going to happen. So we realize that God should God should be over us. It's God, Jesus, man, woman, and child or children. Unless we have that order of things, nothing's going to work. And if you don't believe me, look at your own life, look at your own family lives, your family lives, look around you, you'll see that nothing is working. We have everything that we need, and yet nothing is working, all right? Another thing that is not going to work, you can study the Bible until you're black and blue in the face. You can mark it up, you can put it on tape recorder, you can speak in other tongues, you're not going to change. You're not going to change. And if you doubt that, look at your life again. If you know yourself, you understand what I'm talking about. You speak in tongue, you tape it on a recorder, you mark it in the book with red and, and blue and yellow pen, you go to church every day, you're not changing. Something is wrong. Uh, I'm also a radio talk show host. I've uh, uh, been doing that for the last five years, and I think I've been doing this TV show about as long uh, almost that length, if not longer, 
of a time. And also, I, I, I don't want to tell you this, but I am a minister. But I don't want to tell you that. And the reason I don't want to tell you that is because you, we have a habit of believing people simply because they say that they are a preacher or a minister or a pastor or something like that, a teacher. If I tell you that, then you're going to automatically believe me. And I could be lying to you, but you'll believe me anyway. So I hate to tell you that, but I will tell you that. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about uh, is the purpose of the church. Well, let's talk about the purpose of the preacher. If a man is called by God, his purpose is to awaken you. Uh, what would happen is God would give him the right words to speak to you that would cause you to remember things that you have forgotten, that you have forgotten. And once you remember those things, because the only way you can remember those things is that God allows you to see them. And once you remember those things, then you no longer need the outer preacher. You no longer need him at all. If, if we had good fathers in the home, we would never, ever, ever need a preacher, period. Uh, the only thing that a preacher does, he kind of do what a father should have done. But most men are weak today. They, they don't love the truth and they're not living by that. So the preacher kind of pick up where the father leaves off at. Um, <clears throat> but a good father would keep you on the right course. As God leads you, he will lead you from childbirth until adulthood. And you would never need the preacher. But because of that, we need preachers. And the preacher simply awakened us to uh, the truth that is in us. And when he awakened us, we are on our way. We don't have to go to church every day to find a preacher. Uh, <clears throat> the church. We have been made to feel that we have to go to church every day. Sunday, Monday, you got to go to Bible class. Wednesday night, Bible class. Thursday night, Bible class. Uh, uh, Thursday morning class. You got to hear this preacher and that preacher. It's a lie. I want you to know it is a lie. We must be careful not to let anyone teach us. We're not supposed to be taught by anyone. And the reason that we are not supposed to be taught by anyone is because we have the truth within us. The truth is, is, is in our hearts. And anytime someone teach you, whether it's the Bible or anything, they cause you to fall away from the truth within yourself and, and wake up to the intellect, to the truth that's in, the false light that's in your head. They cause you to learn things by rote. You remember things. Uh, you study the Bible, you remember scriptures, and you quote them back. And what happened is, by studying the Bible and remembering the word, it caused you to, it deceives you. It makes you think that you know it, and you don't. You really don't know it. And a good way to know that you don't know it, look at your life. I know for a fact, when you find the word that is in your heart, it changes your life. You find perfect peace. You find patience. You find understanding. Uh, the world began to uh, become subject to you, and you're no longer subject to the wor uh, world. You no longer need anyone to guide you, but you're guided by that truth that uh, is within you. But when you go to church and you study that Bible, the preacher study at night, he come to church on Sunday morning, and he quote back to you, he interpret the Bible for you, he's keeping you away from the truth. I'm telling you, that's why... Uh, um, within our community, within the black community, we have churches going up. I mean, w right down here, West End of this Church of God in Christ. This man is about, is about to build a $50 million, whatever, church. And yet, all around that church, the communities are falling apart. Dope dealers on the street, prostitutions, homosexuality, everything around the building is going haywire. But on Sunday mornings, people line up going to church. And those people that are going to church, their kids are on drugs. Uh, the husband can't deal with the wife. The wives are mean and nasty, and yet they got the word. The husbands are weak, afraid of the woman, and yet they have the word. Before they can walk out of the church, they're fighting. But a, a, a few minutes prior to that, they was like praising the Lord and lifting up holy hands and just feeling all good. Getting high, getting high off the word. And nothing has changed. We got to wake up 
to the reality that we are being used by ministers. Not all. I, I do want to say not all. <coughs> Just 99.9% uh, of them. 99.9. .9, not all. Uh, but most preachers, 99.9% .9 of them are not called by God. They're called by their mothers. Or they're called by somebody that says, you know, boy, you sure sound smart. One day you're going to be a preacher. <laughs> Excuse me. I have a little stuff in my throat, so I'm sorry about that. They said, one day, boy, you're going to be a preacher. And, and so they believed that. And they grew up. They was too weak to deal with the world. They couldn't find another job. So they studied the Bible and became a preacher. And so it's easy to become one. And because we as black people have, have been told that if a man says that he's a preacher, we have to honor and respect that, even if we know he's not. So that, this, is, this is one of the reasons that most of these preachers are, are misleading and misguiding the people is because they have not been called by God. Anytime a preacher tells you that he has to go to church to learn what God has told him to tell you, he has not been called by God. I want you to ask your minister, uh, Reverend, Reverend Minister, if God has called you to tell his people what to do, how does another preacher know what to tell you that God want to tell you? How can you go to school and another preacher is going to tell you what God said? Please tell me that, uh, Reverend Preacher, and see what he has to say to you. All right. Uh, the one thing that I can almost assure you, your preacher is not going to allow you to question him because he doesn't want you to know that he does not know what he's talking about. Uh, I tried that before. I remember uh, I was born, I was born a, uh, a, a Baptist, and I was born a Democrat. I've soon, I've since then repented, and I'm no longer a Democrat, and I'm no longer a Baptist. Uh, I'm a free man now. But uh, I remember preachers who would, would do things, weird things, mess around with different women, they was fat as a pig because they would go to, your, you know, the different houses and eat dinner after church, eat up all your food, and they had the best food. We would have leftover while they had the best food. And, and then you try to ask these preacher, uh, Reverend Preacher, I don't feel like a man. I don't feel like I'm finding God. What is wrong with me? You know what he tell you? Well, the Bible says this, but Reverend Preacher, I don't understand the Bible. Well, that's what the Lord say. And that's all I have to say about it. That's a blind fool. He has no idea what he's doing, and you're crazy for following that man, all right? Don't, don't do that. If a preacher has to go to church, I mean, go to school to learn about the Bible, he is not, uh, he's not called by God. Without a doubt in my heart, he's not called by God. He's called by somebody else, but not God. Uh, please wake up. All I want to do, I don't want to sound like I'm putting the preachers down, but somebody has to tell the truth. Because the black community is going to hell in a handbasket. And we are moving fast toward hell. I counsel nearly every day, either by telephone or, or, or in person, with people who are in these churches and their lives are screwed up. Absolutely screwed up. And they are afraid to let anybody know that they are not, uh, uh, quote unquote, saved. So they have to hide it and just pretend that they are. We can no longer go in hiding. We got to realize that we don't know so that we can find it. Don't follow your preacher. Forget about him. Let's talk about the Bible for a minute. We have often been told that we should believe in the Bible. That somehow or another, the Bible is the word of God. We got to believe in that Bible. And um, we have uh, stayed up until midnight, burning the light, can uh, candle lights, trying to study that word and get that word in us so we can live right and do the right thing. I got some sad news for you. It will not happen. First of all, you can't put the word in you. you ha isn't that like crazy to think that you can put the word in you, within you, and then once you put the word in you, you can start living the word. I mean, just think about that for a minute. That is absolutely crazy to even believe that. But yet, there are so many people out there who believe that crazy idea, and they try to do it. I tried it for a long time, so I know about this. Uh, the last church that I attended was uh, Crenshaw Christian Center. 
and they are heavy on the word. You know, study that Bible, put that word in you, know that word. And I studied that word, and they showed me how to speak in other tongues, and I spoke in tongues. Nothing happened. I used to go to church and get all fired up, and before I could get home, I was having sex. I was so, matter of fact, I was so horny before I left the church because I was feeling so good with the word and all that singing. It just made me horny, and I couldn't hardly wait to get home to have sex. You know what I'm saying? That's all that it does. I do want to say that the Bible is an important book, but not for us to worship. Uh, the Bible is the word from God, but it is, it is not the word of God. When I come back from this break, I'm going to tell you where the word of God is found. Back in a moment. Bond, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. For more information, call us toll free. 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. All right, welcome back to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. This is a very important program tonight. So, you, you, you know, if you haven't called your enemy yet, you should call them. Uh, before I went to break, I was going to tell you, I, we were talking about the Bible. Uh, and I was saying that the Bible is the word from God, but it is not the word of God. The word of God is in our, is in our heart. The word made flesh. And it's there that we should look for it. And if you were to read the Bible on your, on your own, uh, the Holy Spirit will guide you in understanding what you've read and what you're reading. It will come to you. Don't try to make yourself know. Resist the temptation to interpret what you read. And at, at some point in your life, you will begin to see clearly. You will begin to understand that the word is in your heart. And it's that word that you should follow. But as long as you are believing in the Bible, and there is nowhere in the Bible where it tells you to believe in the Bible. You can't find that in the Bible. You cannot find it anywhere in the Bible where it says, believe in the Bible. But you can find in the Bible where it says, believe in God. That is our only belief is in God. If you believe in the Bible, you do not believe in God. Because you can only have one God at a time. You can't serve two. And so if you believe in the Bible, how are you going to believe in God? All right. We've been misguided in that area. We have been told that if we study the Bible, we are putting the word in, our, in, in us, within us, and then we can live it. It's not going to work. The word is already there. And the Bible is a road map that leads back to the word. It tells you where to look. It tells you what to do and what not to do. It tells you about the stories of men who have gone before us and the mistakes that they made. And as a result of making those mistakes, how they suffered. And then those that didn't make mistakes, how they got over, how they lived, and how they grew, and how they understand and they walked in understanding and wisdom. As long as you believe in that Bible, you're not going to believe in God. We must be careful as to what we believe in and who we believe in. If you believe in the preacher, you can't believe in God. If you believe in your husband or your wife or, or your children or drugs or alcohol or sex or, or anything else, you absolutely cannot believe in God. You can only have one God. And if you, I, I want you to test this. A lot of you are addicted to your preacher. You cannot get away from him. If you miss church on Sunday, you feel like your whole week is screwed up because you didn't go to hear the word from your God. And that is because your faith is in the man. And many of these preachers, 99.9% .9 of them, they want you to believe in them. Because if you believe in them, then you're subject to them. They can lead you anywhere that they want you to go. They can take your money. They can do anything that they want to do to you because you believe in them. They are your God. The Bible tells us that uh, too much study uh, causes the soul to be weary. You know, you, you, you do all this studying, and it's not good for the soul. It causes you to become weary. It puffs up our ego. It, 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 it puffs our pride up. It makes us think that we are God and that we know it. And of ourselves, we can resolve our own life. We won't say that to ourselves, 
but that's how we live and that's what we believe because of all this studying that, that we do. Get away from studying that Bible. The word study is a mistake in the Bible. Uh, men make mistakes and they, that is definitely one mistake they made within the Bible. And mainly because study implies that you look outside of yourself for the answer. You look out here. You're not going to find the answer outside of yourself. The answer is within us. What we're looking for is the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Spirit and everything is inside of us. But when we look outside for it, we won't find it. And that's what study implies. And I think that is one of the reasons some other preacher and many of them are telling you to study because they don't know what they're talking about and they think that that is true. God has given us the ability, ability to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We yearn for him. We hunger for him. And in doing that, we find him. And, we, and when we find him from within ourselves, then we know him and we can begin to go on with our life. But as long as you're studying the Bible, you're not going to ever find God. Now, we should read the Bible. You can read it. You know, in your search, you can read it. And don't try to interpret it. Don't try to figure out what it's talking about. Just, just sit there and read it. And then put it down and go your way. And the understanding will come. You have to resist the temptation in your imagination to interpret the word. Because Satan is always working on your imagination. And everything that happens, he's always coming to you with the answer. The answer sounds like you. You can hear your own voice. Or it may sound like a neighbor or a friend. Or you may not recognize the voice, but there's a voice in your imagination that is trying to interpret the Bible for you as well. Resist that. That is wrong. So we got to get out of the Bible. You can read the Bible, but don't believe in the Bible. Don't study the Bible and you shall find it. All right. I just, you know, I, I, I got to put this in there. I know that a lot of you people are like going literally crazy now. You cannot believe that I'm, I am trying to tell you not to study the Bible. I mean, because you're so addicted to it, it's like cocaine. Uh, it's like, if I don't have my cocaine, what am I going to do? You know, where will I get how? How would I believe if I don't have my cocaine? And, and so that's what the Bible is like. Uh, most people uh, use the Bible in the way that a cocaine addict used cocaine. And the preacher used the Bible the way that a cocaine dealer <coughs> uses cocaine. <coughs> he give you a little draw you in and then he control you. It's a fact. It's a fact. So help me, Lord. It is a fact. So get away from that. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say this, because you probably wonder, well, how is it that Jesse think that he knows everything? Who taught him? Why is it that uh, he can say that these preachers are wrong? And yet he called himself a minister, even though he didn't want to tell us that he was a minister. Um, one day I was sitting um, at the age of 37, I believe, and I was um, um, praying, but I wasn't asking, any, asking anything of God. Prior to that, I had been told, will you pray, say. Will you pray, say. I'm serious. Will you pray, say. So I, all my life I've been saying when I pray and nothing happened. You know, I, I got nothing. I asked for cars. I asked for fine women. I asked for houses. I asked the Lord to bless my mama. Bless my daddy, bless my sister, brother. It didn't work. That is vain prayer. And God tells us not to be like those people who pray in the public, who pray aloud, that they get their glory right then. Because what happens when you are up in the church and hooping and hollering and praying, the people that are looking at you is causing you to feel good about what you're doing. And that's your reward right there. That is your reward. But when you pray in secret, when you pray in secret, then God blesses you publicly, outwardly. And, and most people don't want to pray in secret because they want to be glorified right away for what they have done. They want to get the credit right then and there, so they won't pray in private. But I was sitting in my prayer closet, and I was not asking anything of God. I was just sitting there, uh, just with my eyes closed. Wanting to know, wanting to understand. By this time in my life, I was so weak. I was insecure. Uh, I had been going to church. I, I used to go to Crenshaw Christian Center on Sundays, Monday nights to hear Fred Price, Wednesday night to hear a woman named Bam. I was such a fool. 
I was sitting under a woman now. Can you believe that? A man sitting under a woman to find God. But anyway, I was going on um, Wednesday night. I would go back on Friday night, and then I would go to men's fellowship. And yet, I was getting worse. I was not getting better. I was, if I had my Bible here, I would show you. I marked it all up. I had different colors. I wrote notes. It did not work. But this time I was sitting and I was praying. We're coming to the end of the program, so I need to wind this up about the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and being quiet and knowing him, all of a sudden I realized I was able to see what was wrong. And the first thing that I saw is that I had resentment, judgment in my heart. I resented my father for not being there because the father has a responsibility to be there for us and guide us. And when he's not there, he leaves us open so mama can come in and overtake us and the world can overtake us and take us off our natural course. So I resented my dad for not being there. I resented my mom for being angry that my dad wasn't there. And you know how women take out their aggression on their children. I saw that and I, and I wept. You know, I just, I wept because I realized that it was wrong that I had hated my parents, and then I realized it had set me back in life because when you hate, what you put out come back on you. And I realized I, you know, that I, it had held me back in life. And then I also realized that of myself, I could do nothing. I could do nothing. I, I, I could see that. I could do nothing. It took away the, the will that I had to try to change my life. I went and I, re, I, I apologized to my parents for hating them. I realized they couldn't help themselves. Now, I thought I loved my parents because I felt emotional love for them. And that's what hatred does. It awakened your sexual, your, uh, uh, sexual need. It awakened your emotion. And you feel like you love, but it's the wrong kind of love. But when I saw that, it changed my whole world. And I've not been the same since then. I discovered that the Holy Spirit is within me that the kingdom of heaven is there, and uh, I've not needed to preach it since then. We're going to have to end this program. We meet every Sunday morning at 1030, and uh, the phone number is going to be given to you on the screen there some kind or another. Uh, if you want to call about our meeting and the address, please do. All are invited, black and white. It doesn't matter what color you are or what kind of problem you have. I can guarantee you, if you come to our meeting, you will get over them. I'll be back next Monday. Tell somebody. All right, welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. Uh, I'm doing a three-part series on Christianity. So last week we did uh, our first uh, part of this particular program. So if you missed it, you can call the studio and they will replay it for you. Uh, because we talked about a lot, and I don't really have time to go over everything that we discussed uh, last week in the last program. Also, if you want more, you want to understand more about what we are talking about, we do have meetings every Sunday morning at 1030. In the middle of this program, at halftime, we are going to give you the address and phone number. And you can call that number and get more information about our meetings, all right? Uh, I am a, a minister, and I, kind of, uh, I don't like saying that because I, I don't want you to believe me just because of my title. Uh, I'm the uh, president of a national nonprofit organization called the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. Nothing is going to change until the man come back to order. God, Jesus, man, woman, and children. And within, within the black community especially, it has been woman, uh, man, sometime man, and then children. And as a result of that, the community is, is screwed up, the family is gone, and all across the country, we're in a lot of troubles. Uh, I'm talking about Christianity tonight because we have been used by uh, uh, the preachers, 99.9% .9 of them, under the heading of Christianity. And they have, uh, they have really done what a cocaine dealer does to an addict. They have fed us the Bible, and they have, they have drawn us in and caused us to be subject to them. We now have to go to church every Sunday to hear from God. We have to go to church every Sunday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to understand the Word. They have caused us to become addicted 
to the word. And as a result, our lives are not changing. We are committing a sin and we need to get over it. We talked about the Holy Spirit being within us and it is there to teach us or he is there to teach us and guide us, instruct us, per perfect our lives. And any time we allow anyone else to do that, we are committing a sin. God is not with us. And anybody who set themselves up to be your teacher is your enemy. Well, uh, a real teacher, if he's called by God, what he does is he brings you back to yourself. He reminds you of what went wrong, and that causes you to wake up, and you can get on with your life. But if you notice, most of you, Christian, have to go to church every day because you have conflict if you don't. We talked about the Bible. You should not believe in the Bible. You should believe in God. The Bible is the word from God, uh, but the word of God is already in our heart. It's in our flesh, and we can go there, look within, and find it. And when you know yourself, you will know the word. It's in there. It's, it's inside of us, so we need to go back. But as long as we're believing in the preacher who tells us to believe in the Bible, we will never find it. The one thing that I want to talk about, and I have notes. I, I don't normally make notes, but I just wrote down a, a couple of topics that I wanted to talk about. I always speak from my heart uh, as I can see the truth. But uh, I want to talk about uh, repentance. You know, how, how you go to church and the preacher tell you, well, you have to repent. you got to repent. And you go, yes, sir, preacher, but how do I repent? Well, first, read 1 John. 1 John something says, if you confess the Lord, uh, and at, uh, if you confess the Lord with your sin, then he's justified to forgive you, something like that. I don't know that. I, I don't remember that scripture, but it's somewhere in the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. So you get up and you repeat that verse. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I confess you as Lord and Savior. Forgive me. And you think that you're free. You shout. You feel good. You jump up and down. You feel good. Now you're a Christian. You walk out of the church. You feel like a Christian. And for a few days, you, you, you know, you, you, you don't, in your mind, you don't sin. You know, you're real nice and polite. Yes, honey. Anything you want to do, husband. Pray to the Lord, husband. And around that fourth day, you forget about that. You, your Christianity and everything is out of the window. And the reason for that is because you have not repented. But the sad thing about that is that they tell you, well, we are not perfect. So if you fall, if you make a mistake, it's okay. Just get up and, uh, and repent again, quote that verse again, and go back and do it again. So you find yourself repeating this act over and over and over again. I used to do it, so I know what I'm talking about. And I know most, of, most people who are Christian are doing the same thing. Um, they are having sex out of wedlock. They lay down there, they have some good sex. And they get up and say, oh, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I confess my sin. I, I couldn't help myself. And you feel good about what you've done. Now you got both. You repent it, and you're feeling good from the sex. It does not work, all right? It will never, ever, ever work. Um, um, I don't want to... Um, I, I, I'm trying to be careful not to interpret the Bible for you. I hope what I really want to do is to cause you to start thinking about your own life and about your Christianity, your relationship with God. Is it really working? Is it real? Are you changing? When you truly repent, um, you will know it. And one of the ways that you will know it is because your whole, uh, the way that you deal with the world will begin to change. Your reaction to the outside world will begin to change. You will notice that you no longer need uh, people in the way that you needed them before. You're no longer subject to things in the world. You don't get your identity from uh, people, places, and things, cars and money, who you hang out with, if you're a close friend with the minister or if you're a close friend with a politician. or You don't get your identity from that. When repentance truly takes place, you begin to change from the world. So you will know it when it truly happens. Um, 
Another thing I want to tell you, and I know that most people don't want to hear this, but I have to tell you, when you truly repent, it is impossible to sin. You cannot sin when you truly repent. You can't sin. So if you're sinning and you're repenting, you're not repentant. It's a lie. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to, to the world and you're deceiving yourself. You cannot love God and, and sin. And your Bible even tells you that. It says that if a man says that he knows God and he sinned, the truth is not in him. If a man says that he knows God and he sinned, the light is not in him. He is a liar. But what has happened, because we are being brainwashed by the preachers and we are deceiving ourselves, we tell ourselves that it's okay. Well, I'm not perfect. I can't help myself. And the Lord understands this. He knows this. So you feel good about what you've done. It's a horrible, horrible mistake. You can't do it. And then a lot of men and women are having sex out of wedlock and they have children. Let's say you have children and you tell yourself, well, I'm not having sex in front of my child, so I'm not doing any harm. It's okay. Uh, the Lord understands it's not working. The sins of the fathers are being passed down to generation after generation after generation. All right. So if you say that you know God and you sin, you are a lie and God is not with you. Whether you like it or not, he's not with you. When I, when I began, when I crossed over into the light, into the truth, um, within my soul, within myself, I found perfect peace. And for the last eight years, it has been that way. I have no inner conflict. I have no fear. I have no doubt. I have no worry. I think not of tomorrow. I don't worry about the past. It's like the past never was. And I can see clearly. I can see. Not out of my head and not out of my intellect, but I can see. I see the right way to go. I see right and I see wrong. And I'm able to resist wrong. And that's what happens when you cross over into righteousness. When you truly cross over into what is right, your life will change. And if your life is not changing, you have not found it. If you need a preacher, you have not found it. If you're addicted to your husband or your wife or your children or, or to the world, you got to have this, you got to have that. And then you're so emotional. If you're still emotional, you have not found God. You don't have him. You don't know him. And you need to know that. All right. Um, again, I, I want to say there's a lot of things that I want to say, but because of time, uh, this program is a 30 minute program. I can't get really into it. So if you have any question, please call the office or come to a meeting and I can answer those questions for you. Um, let's talk about. Uh, oh, this is what I want to add to you, too. Uh, most Christians are very, very emotional. I have been on many radio programs and TV programs and I've talked about the truth. I've talked about how wicked uh, the black politicians are, you know, people like Maxine Waters and, and Jesse Jackson and others, and how the preachers are using us, and how most mothers, not all, but most women destroy their kids. They are real mean and nasty to their children, and they cause their children to fall away from grace. And mainly because they hate their husbands because they are weak, and they hate their fathers because they wasn't there for them, so they're taking out their aggression on their children. And nine times out of ten, these people call me up on the radio program or, or write me letters and they're cursing me out and they're screaming and yelling and just calling me everything but a child of God. And I want you to know today that if you truly love God and if you're walking in the light, in the truth, you will have patience with me because you will know that you need to show me the right way. I could be wrong, but your lack of patience is uh, tells me that you're wrong and that I'm right because I have patience. I, at one time I didn't have patience. I had the spirit or the identity or the nature of my mother. And so I was impatient. I was insecure. I, I was angry, just like a woman. But when I crossed over, then that nature left 
and now I'm operating from my father's nature, from God's nature, which should have been of my he earthly father, but because he was weak. And that's what's wrong with most men. They're just like women. If you notice, they wear ponytails and earrings and uh, they're very emotional, insecure because they have the nature of their mother, the spirit, the identity of their mothers. And most preachers are like that. That's why most preachers allow women to be ministers in the church. They're afraid to tell them the true, uh, 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 the true reality of, uh, that a woman should never be over a man. Uh, so they're just like a woman. They are afraid to stand up to the woman. They are subject to her and they have not been born again. Salvation is about overcoming the spirit of the woman and uh, coming into the spirit of God, his nature. We are born of the woman and because we come through her, we take on a bit of her identity, her nature. At one time it wasn't like that. God created man so we didn't have to come through the woman. But because of what Adam did, we now have to come through her. And as a result of that, we are subject to her for a while. And after we finish making a fool out of ourselves, we are supposed to cry out to God. Please help me, God. I'm making a fool out of myself. Forgive me. And it began to change. Most people don't know that. I want to talk about how to pray. Prayer is very important. As a matter of fact, it's the primary of my life. Uh, for the last eight years, I have not gone without prayer. I get up in the morning, I have my time with the Father, I go into my closet, and I be still and know Him. Uh, before I go to bed at night, I do the same thing. And uh, during the day, I am aware of Him. You know, I go in and out of my imagination, but for the most part, part I am aware of Him. Uh, we are about to take a break, and when I come back from break, I'm going to tell you that praying in other tongues, hooping and hollering, and all that stuff you've been taught is a lie. It will not work. We're going to take a break, and I'll talk to you about that in a moment. It's electric. Bond, the brotherhood organization of a new destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. For more information, call us toll-free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. Okay, we are back. Welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson, for those that are just tuning in. And we are talking about Christianity. Uh, Christianity is, a, I'm telling you, it's the right way to go. It's just that we're being led astray and we're going about it the wrong way. There's nothing like loving the truth and living by that truth. So I'm not putting it down. I want to bring you to, to the place where you may find it and begin to truly live the life that you're supposed to live, all right? Um, I was talking about prayer before we went to break and um, um, how we have been misguided in prayer. You know, the Bible says that, and I'm quoting the Bible. It's in your Bible. I am quoting the Bible, so pull out your Bible because most of you believe it if you read it in the Bible, right? The Bible said that those preachers, preachers that are telling you to pray out in the public, uh, hoop and holler and let it be known that you are praying and, and ask for things of God, give me a car, give me a truck, give me a wife, give me all of that. He said those preachers are hypocrites. He said that those preachers are a bag of bones. They're dogs. They, they deceive the people. They keep the truth away from the people. And that is, that is happening today in a way that is really scary. Uh, uh, many, many, many people are being led astray. And only a few, a very few are finding, finding that right way. And it's those people that know that what they are doing is not working. You know, they may go to church and they try it out. It doesn't work. They know something wrong. They move on. They're looking for the truth. Uh, I was told... I remember when I first went to Crenshaw Christian Center, at the end of the service, they came up and said, well, if you want to speak in tongues, then come down here. And uh, so I went down and they took me to a back room. And some, oh, I remember the guy too, a man laid his hand, well, he didn't lay, I think he laid hand, but he told me, he, he, he showed me some scriptures in the Bible about praying at other tongues. And uh, he just kind of got me all emotional. And he, he, he began to do it. And I got the idea of how to do it. I heard it in church, too, because they were doing it in church. And so I started doing it, too. 
And um, so I was wondering, why don't I understand what I'm saying? And they said, well, because uh, it's in other tongues, I can't understand it, but God does. And then if you do it in the church, then somebody else around you can interpret it for you. I believe that for a long time. And I used to get up in the morning at 5 o'clock. Every morning I used to pray at other tongues. You could hear me hooping and hollering. I lived in this apartment building. And uh, uh, my manager lived right across, a white guy. He lived right across from me. And he used to ask me, Jesse, what is going on in your apartment? He thought I was doing like a voodoo or something, you know. I'm over there hooping and hollering and praying another tongue, waking up everybody. Nothing happened. That is not of God. It is not of God. It is not. That's the devil stuff. I'm telling you, it is not of God. And then uh, when I was a Baptist, they told me to ask God for what I want. You know, uh, pray for a car and pray for this and pray for that. And I did. And, you know, in some cases I got the car or I got that job, but I, I was still unhappy. I didn't have peace within myself because I think that you can get what you ask for. I mean, just think about I, I want to say this to the guys. Just think about how many times you've asked God for a wife or you asked God for a woman. And when you got one, you got the devil. You had hell on your hand. Uh, so you can get what you want. It just, I mean, you get what you ask for, but it's not what you want. Um, so I used to do all those different kind of prayer things that they taught me, and it did not and does not work. work. It wasn't until I got still. The Bible says, be still and know God. And it wasn't until I got still that I was able to see, and my life began to change. And as a result of uh, being able to see, the blind man at the gate said, I once was blind, but now I see. And everybody said, well, you know, how did it happen? I remember when you were blind. How is it that you can see? And the man said, well, you know, I, I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. I just know I can see. That is my case. I can see. And, uh, and it comes from being still and allowing the truth to catch up with, with me. The hardest thing in the world for people to do is to sit still and allow the truth to catch up with you. Uh, some people say it's boring sitting still and not asking anything, just being quiet. Um, uh, some people say that I tried it, but I couldn't do it that long. And what it is is that our pride can't handle the truth. We have to keep active. We have to be active so we can run away from the very thing that can save us. If we allow that anxiety to overtake us, if we were to be still and let the truth catch up with us, then we can overcome. Then we can see. When we are hooping and hollering and studying, uh, praying in other tongues and carrying on, all that we are doing is running away from the truth. We're running away from the very thing that can save us. It is no different than taking drugs. It is no different than having sex. It is no different than, than, than eating a lot. Uh, I remember when I first stopped having sex, you know, I kind of got over that. I became addicted to food, man. Whenever uh, a little anxiety would come, I would like, you know, I would have to have a bowl of ice cream. And, and like ice cream is my favorite thing with, uh, I like uh, black walnut or any kind of ice cream that has nuts. Uh, pistachio nut or black walnut. And I like to put a little strawberry soda in there. And then if I have a little piece of cake, you know, put some cake on it. It was like having sex with a woman. I'm serious. I would like totally get high. I feel good. I forget about everything from this food because the food took the place of sex. It helped me to, it caused me to forget my problems. It made me feel good about being wrong. And so all these fat people that's running around town, they got a lot of problems. And so they're eating food to run away from the problem instead of facing the problem and overcome. I'm serious. So help me God. And if you don't believe me, try to get them not to eat a full course meal. They'll kill you. I'm telling you, they will absolutely kill you. Because when you don't eat, then the truth began to catch up with you. You feel this anxiety that something is wrong. You begin to see that something is wrong with you, and you don't want to see it. So you eat food, or you take drugs, or you have sex, or you judge your neighbor, or your, your neighbor, or your enemy, so that you don't have to face yourself. So that's what I used to do with food. I'm overcoming that now. I'm not totally over it yet, but I am overcoming that. I do know that I am using food to run away from something, so I am overcoming that. But when you sit still, 
Be still and know God. The truth will catch up with you and you will overcome. I promise you that. But as long as you're running away from the truth by hooping and hollering and praying, by speaking in other tongues, by studying the Bible, remembering the word, you're not going to ever overcome it. And most of you know that. But you don't want to face the reality of that, all right? But you know, your kids are screwed up. Your life is screwed up. You can't find a good man. You can't find a good woman. Another thing I want to say about that, it just occurred to me, is that when you find God, the world becomes subject to you. And everything that you need come to you. You don't have to ask for it. It will be yours. God created heaven and earth for us. He created these things on earth for us. And his children, these things will come to us. We don't have to ask for them. He knows our needs even before we ask. So why even bother to ask? We, we don't know what we want. We have no idea what we want. We don't know his thoughts. We don't know what we want. He knows and he will give it to you. So stop asking. I know that um, many of your church, uh, churches are telling you, ask, ask for what you want. Uh, name it and claim it. Uh, in the name of the Lord, I lay my hand on this car and it's mine. In the name of Jesus, I lay my hand on this man and he belongs to me. He's mine. Yeah, you may get it, but you're going to get the wrong thing. You're getting hell. I want to talk quickly about the imagination because uh, uh, we have about three minutes left in this program. The imagination it's dangerous. It will destroy you. you got to overcome your imagination. When Adam fell away from grace, see, Adam used to be conscious of God. He was on the same mind as God. But when he believed the woman who believed the serpent, he bit whatever the fruit was of knowledge or whatever, under, uh, knowledge, he fell away from God, and then he woke up in his imagination. And in his imagination, he believed that he could be God. He believed that he was God and that he is God. And that's how most of you are. You live in your imagination. You think that you're God. Uh, some good examples. Um, um, let's say that uh, you want to, uh, what's a good example? I can't think of a good example. Let's say you have to confront your enemy. I'm going to go over to uh, Joe's house or Mary's house and I'm going to tell Mary exactly what I feel about her. I'm going to tell her how bad she is and what she's done to me and how much I don't like her and what she think about me. So you plan all this stuff in your head and when you get to Mary's house, she's not thinking that at all. It's nothing like what you thought it would be. Uh, you think that you can heal yourself. You think, you know, you know what you think about your imagination. I can't think of any good things right now. But you got to come out of your head. Those thoughts that you hear, whether it's your voice or someone else's voice, is lying to you. It is not of God. Positive thinking is wrong. Those people that are telling you to think positive are lying to you. They're setting you up to fail. There is no such thing as positive thinking. How in the world are you going to make yourself think positive? Please tell me that. Where are you getting these thoughts from? Are you creating your own thoughts? I want one person to call me up when you get this number from the program and tell me how you create your own thought. You're not creating your thoughts. They're coming from somewhere else. It, it, it's crazy to think that, but I understand why we think it. The preacher tell us to do it. The um, positive thinker uh, motivation speakers tell us to do it. We tell ourselves that we have to create our own thought. You're not the creator of your thoughts. And God is not in your imagination. All right? We're out of time again. We have one more program. I'll be back next Monday night. Tell a friend. See you later.
Welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. Uh, this is the uh, third part series to Christianity. And I am moving kind of fast on a lot of these things. I realize that I don't have the time to really answer a lot of the things that I like to get into. And also I like it when I appreciate it when people are with me and they can ask me questions. It, it just really, it, may, it causes me to really uh, see clear and uh, it brings out the best of me. So I'm kind of moving real fast about Christianity, just hitting on some good points so that you can uh, begin to think uh, for yourself. Because if you don't uh, uh, start thinking for yourself, things are not going to get better for you. It will not change. I guarantee you that. So we'll talk about Christianity. Uh, uh, this is our third program. If you miss the last two, just call the station and they will replay it for you. I'm the uh, president of a national organization called the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny Bond. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. The man should be head of his family as Christ is the head of him. And um, um, uh, that is not happening. Uh, women are taking over. And so we got to get that back to order. And, and that is not going to change until men understand what is wrong with themselves so they can repent and overcome it. And women too, women as well. Uh, don't let anyone teach you the Bible. Uh, preachers are teaching you the Bible. They are uh, interpreting the Bible for you. And as a result, they're setting you up to fail. I guarantee you that anybody that is sitting under these ministers, preachers, teachers, or whatever they are, and they are being taught the Bible their lives are not changing. They don't have peace. The Holy Spirit is within us, and he's, he's there to teach us and guide us and instruct us and perfect our life. I'm a living witness. It does happen. Our body, bodies is the uh, temple of the Lord, not the building. Our bodies. We have everybody, their mama, going to church, and yet they're having sex out of wedlock. They're smoking dope. They're parted up. They're mean to their children, impatient with their children. Uh, they are insecure. They have fear and doubt. They are corrupting the body. They are corrupting the temple of the Lord. We've been made to feel guilty, and we've been made to believe that uh, the church is the, uh, the building, is the uh, temple, and it's not. It's our body. Uh, the purpose of the building is to come together and fellowship. Um, uh, when we come together with one another, we hear testimonies, uh, what others have gone through and how they dealt with it and how they found that right way. And from their testimony, if we are seeking, it awaken us so that we too can find the right way within us and go with our lives. That is the purpose of, of fellowship. And uh, the minister is supposed to be there. Uh, he doesn't have to always be there, but he's there to pretty much help awaken us too. As God gives him the right word to give to us, it reminds us of what we have done wrong, or where we went wrong, how we lost the truth so we can come back to it. All right? Um, so we've, we've talked about those things. If you believe in the Bible, you can't believe in God. Uh, you can only believe in one thing at a time, and that is God. If you don't believe in God, then you're lost. All right? You should have no other God before him. Uh, you go to church because you believe in the preacher. The preacher tells you to study the Bible so and believe in the Bible. Now you believe in the Bible. And now, and, and, but yet you're still subject to that outside. We must look within us. The Bible tells us to look within. The kingdom of heaven is within us. And we should look there for the truth. If you're looking outside for the truth, you're not going to find it. You will be old and gray. And all you have is a bunch of excuses. I've learned that the imagination is a system of excuses. Everything that we do, we quickly get an excuse for it. Just as Adam did. He, the minute that he disobeyed God and believed Eve, God said, what's going on, Adam? Why are you doing what you did? Well, the woman made me do it. And that's how we are today because we live in our imagination. And so as a man thinketh, so as he is. You got to come out of your imagination. You've never created a thought. You are not your thoughts. What you're thinking is not you. Those are not your thoughts. But if you believe it, then you began to live it. All right. So as a man thinking, so as he is. So that's why you have to come out of your imagination. Um, 
um, what else we talked about? Sin. How do we sin? You know, if you guys have a question, please go to the mic if you have a question. Right? Y'all just sitting there looking at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, sin. You cannot overcome sin simply by just quoting a chapter or a verse in the Bible and just saying, God, I've sinned, forgive me, and uh, something, you know, whatever that verse. It doesn't work. Many of you have tried it. You've done it over and over again, and yet you're sinning. You're first sinning in your pride, in your ego, in your imagination. You believe what your thoughts tell you. You believe that you are your thoughts. You study the Bible and you remember the scriptures. And from remembering the scripture, it puffs you up. And it, it makes you think that you got it. It makes you think that you are God. It makes you think that you know the truth. Even though it doesn't work, it's not changing your life, but you're so puffed up and you're so prideful, you still believe that you know the truth. You got to know yourself. And the only way that you know yourself, yeah, you can come to the mic. The only way you know yourself is you got to look within. You got to pull away from the world and begin to know yourself. And when you do that, you will understand God and you will understand the world. All right. Yes, sir. I have a question for you. You said that pastors are misleading their congregation. Why do you say that? Um, as far as the drugs, the dope, and they're, I guess, making a lot of money, but they're not doing the right things as far as pastors should do. Yeah. For the congregation. Of the are you a Christian? I am a Christian. You're a Christian. Yes, how, I am. how do you know that you are? Well, I mean, I'm saved, I'm baptized, and I witness to others about the goodness of the Lord. You do? And so, how do you know that you're saved? Well, I just told you. Uh, you said that you are saved and baptized and you witness to others. And That's I mean, I'm, if you believe in the Lord, then yeah. you are saved. I mean, that He'll come back and save you from and when you say save what are you saved from sin from sin from so you don't earth, sin anymore the, the things on earth well I mean I, yes of course you do sin yeah I mean so I, you're not saved from sin yeah true so then how are you saved uh, she hadn't thought about that right and that's how most people are they don't think about that and what the preacher does uh, and not all, let me just say not all, just so many. I don't know of any that uh, uh, is different from what we were talking about. I know one, but other than that, I don't know any, any more. Um, what the preacher does, he brings you into the church, he brings you into the church, and he teaches you the Bible. And he interprets the Bible for you. And because you believe him, whatever he tells you, you can't help but believe that that is true. Because your faith is in the preacher. So he's like, he's like the uh, cocaine dealer. You know how if a person want to get you hooked on cocaine, they'll give you a little bit of it free first. Mm -hmm. And once they get you hooked, then they can control you. Well, that's what the preacher does with the Bible. They get you hooked by saying that they are from God. God bring them, you know, call them to do this. And they get you hooked on the word. And now you're unable to understand the word from within. You got to keep going so back to the dope dealer. Try to get you involved in church, but yet they get you involved to mislead you? Absolutely. Absolutely. To control you. They hypnotize you with the word. And so what you go, and then what happened, your, your ego, your pride get in the way, and you don't want to admit that something's wrong because you want to think of yourself as a Christian, right? So you go out, you have sex out of wedlock, you still, you get angry real easy, you have no patience. But what you tell yourself, well, I'm not perfect. Because a preacher... Your dope dealer has told you that you're not perfect. So we're all human. We're not perfect. And we're expected to do these things and just sin again. So that's how the preacher do it. They set you up to fail by causing you to believe in them and become addicted to them. Because I'm telling you, buddy, when you, when you truly find the truth, when you repent, you won't be sinning. And you would know without a doubt that so you what, crossed over to the truth. What makes you any different from the other preachers out there that's... That you said 99 point whatever four. 99.9. Nine. Nine. I try to leave a little percentage in there because I know that there, there are, you know, there are one or two out there. Now, Just I one know, or two? Yeah. I know one, but I don't know two. So there are, but I'm sure there, there's always an exception to the rule. It's just that you and I don't know anybody like that. What makes me different is that I don't want to control you. I know that the same 
uh, God, the same Holy Spirit that is teaching me and guiding me and causing me to see is also inside of you. And my responsibility is to get you to see that. And uh, he shows me how to give you the right words to see. And once you see where you've gone wrong, seeing causes you to repent. And once you repent, you're on your way. You no longer need me or anybody to guide you because he will guide you. And that's the difference. I don't want to control you. They do. I don't want you to keep coming back so that I can build a huge church. I want you to be free so that God can guide so you're just you. just trying to preach the word instead of just trying to make money for the church. Like, I mean, most pastors try to make, um, to me, in my opinion, they always ask for money for, to build and the building church. Building funds. And they don't give a damn about you. I'm telling you, they don't give a damn about you because if they did, they wouldn't control you. They would set you free. They wouldn't convince you to come back every Sunday. If you went back, it would be because you want to go back. You know, I like what he said. I want to go back and hear a little more. But you wouldn't feel guilty if you didn't go back. They made you feel guilty. Am I right about that? I guess. I mean, you don't have to agree with me if you don't agree. But do they make you feel guilty about not going to church? Yes, I mean, sometimes, most yeah. times. Most yeah, they do. Time. What I want you to do this week, I want you to tell somebody you don't go to church. You don't go to church? Oh, my God. You're going to go to hell. You're a sinner. You know, they've been convinced that you have to go to church. When our body is the temple, if we worship God in there, we're then we're with him. All right? Okay. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Yes, sir. Uh, Jesse, on another show, you said um, if you're sinning or if you've sin sinned and fallen, then you don't have the truth in you. Right. Something like that. Uh I disagree with that to some extent because uh, it seems to me in my life and in uh, some other people that I see, it appears that a lot of times the journey that you go on once you start to discover the truth is sometimes falling and then going forward. But if you look at it like a graph and you look at yourself maybe six years ago or something like that, you can see you're a different person now than you were back then. Right. So obviously something is working in your behalf, but you may not be perfect where you're always doing good. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that um, once you wake up, mm -hmm. you begin to see and what you, you're able to see good and evil. You're able to see temptation coming at you. And as a result, as a result of being able to see temptation, you're able to resist it, you know, within yourself. And so being able to resist it prevents you from sinning. What is happening, uh, you are constantly discovering things about yourself. You're constantly discovering the wrong in you. Yeah. And so as you discover the wrong in you, you're overcoming that and it's no longer part of your nature. Mm -hmm. Then you see something else, you overcome that. You're constantly growing. Right. So in constantly discovering and overcoming, you're not sinning. But yet there are It's impossible times. to go back and repeat the same sin. But there are times when I would you know, get angry would would be a sin. I would. That's that's a sin, is not getting. If angry. you're judging, it's okay. You can get angry and not judge. But if you're getting angry and hating the people that you're angry at, then you you haven't even okay. found the truth yet. Yeah. Because once you find the truth, your nature changed, and in his nature, there is no judgment. There is no uh, uh, fear and hostility and all that stuff. So if you are doing this, it, because you haven't really found the way yet. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you have fear inside you, if you see fear, if you get nervous, let's say you're going to walk to the microphone and you get nervous. Well, that's not fear. fear. Uh, what is the difference between nervousness and fear? Fear is when you don't trust that things are going to work out. Oh, all right. All right? All right. Okay. That's what fear is. Uh, when you try to figure out your own life, right. when you have a five-year plan mm -hmm. or a six-month plan and you think that you know how things should be. Right. You don't trust that things will work out. You don't have that uh, wait and see attitude. But you may have that. You might see yourself starting to do that and then catch yourself and then let it go. In other words, you see yourself, your mind, you start looking ahead or you start thinking about tomorrow or something like that. Yeah. You become aware of it and then you, it, it, It'll it, pass. it's gone. Yeah. But see, when you can see that you're thinking about tomorrow, the only reason that you can see it because God is showing it to you. Right. And by him showing it to you, he also prevents you from getting involved with it. So he's showing you so, sometimes in steps, maybe. You're getting, you're growing as you go. But if you're seeing it and not doing it, then you're not seeing it. Right. Because when you see it and don't do it, then you can't see it. But if you right. see it, if you don't see it, then you will see it. Then you will see it. Right. 
And so the whole purpose of waking up, when you find God, when you come back to consciousness, you're able to see sin before you can overtake it. Most people don't see it right. because they live in their imagination. Right. Thanks. All right. All right. We're going to take a break and we'll be back in a moment. Okay, we are back. Uh, I'm really excited because we've been talking about Christianity for the last three weeks. And uh, I've learned a lot uh, from it. And I hope that you have. I want to I wanna really make clear, we're not talking about all. I'm of, often accused of, uh, of talking about all. There are a few, a few, a few, a few preachers who is on the right track. But those preachers are not in a school being taught by someone else. They're not in school. They're being guided by the Holy Spirit. There are a few people in the church who are looking for the truth, and that's why they're there. But most people are not. They're not. They want to be validated. They want to be, they want someone to make them feel good. Most people are not looking for the truth. There are a few, and those people will find the truth. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I wanted to ask you a question. How would you respond to people if what you're saying is true and you wanted to talk to someone who goes to church all the time and it just was to mention what you had to say? I mean, oftentimes it'd be like seen as you being the person trying to lead them astray or trying to take them away from church if they're supposed to be doing the right thing. And if you, you know, may question some of the things that they do at church yeah. or some of the things that is happening when you know them on a personal level when they're outside of church, um, how do you respond to somebody if you're just trying to point out maybe some inconsistencies that they do in church without them blaming you as you maybe being, you know, caught astray or being led by the devil or trying to take them away from so church? So your question is, how would you tell a Christian that they are crazy and they don't know what they're talking about? I guess. So yeah. How do you tell a Christian they're not yeah. a Christian yeah. when everybody thinks what they're doing is the right thing? You know what? Um, um, the hardest people in the world to tell the truth to is a Christian. Not all of them, most of them. Why do you say that? Because they are afraid. Uh, again, it's like the dope dealer. You know, you try to take away his drug, he go crazy because he doesn't have anything to rely on. And when you tell a Christian that they are making a mistake and that they don't know what they're talking about, they freak out because, first of all, they got to take a second look. You know, they got to admit that something is wrong, that even though I am studying the Bible, I go to church every day, I do everything my ministers say, my life is not changing. It means that they got to let go of something. They got to look at themselves and they don't want to do that. So to tell them that they're going to curse you out, they're going to scream, they're going to try to make you... Uh, Doubt yourself because they don't want to face it. So what you have to do is just tell them and leave it alone. Don't try to force it. Don't try to convince them. You just speak the truth, and the truth will take care of itself. And make sure you're not judging them. You know, just tell them the truth and, and, and let go. But it's hard to do that because they are so addicted to the word until it's hard for them to break away from it. They have fear. They trust in the Bible and not in God. And as a result, it's hard for them to examine themselves. Okay. You know, it's like trying to take away their drug. Take away their Bible, they'll kill you. All right? So you just have to do it and don't judge them on it. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, um, when you pray, be still and know God. Go into your room or your prayer closet. Actually, when the Bible says prayer closet, it doesn't really mean a room. It means sit still and look within. Go into yourself and know him. Know that he's God and not you. But most people believe that when you when he say go into your prayer closet, that he actually means go into a room. But it's go into yourself. When you read the Bible, you're going to notice that uh, many other disciples and, and uh, the people that the men that follow God, even Jesus Christ himself, he will often pull away from the people. He would go to a mountaintop or a private place. He would go into himself and he would know God's will, that the Lord will be done and not yours, and not his. And we must be the same way. Um, I've learned uh, not to plan my life. I have no idea what I want. I have no idea what his will is. And so I can see clearly to let go and let his will be done, all right? Your ministers are not telling you that because they're hypocrites and they want to control you. And I'm talking to white people, black people, Mexicans. What color Mexican? Uh, brown? brown, oh, brown people, uh, <laughs> Japanese, or whatever you are. If anyone is teaching you the Bible, they're your enemy and not your friend. If they're teaching you the Bible, they know no, they they are not called by God. If you have a woman over you, 
teaching you the Bible, you're in trouble. If you're going to a church that a woman is the head of the church, you're in trouble. A woman should never be the head of man. All right. It doesn't work. There's an order of things. God, Jesus, man, woman and child. The woman took man away from God. She shall not take you back to him. She's jealous of, of your relationship with God. If you know that women are very jealous of men, man and his relationship with God. And the evidence is she's always trying to keep the attention on her. You know, she's always trying to outshout God so that your focus would be on her. Just as Eve was jealous of God and Adam, uh, uh, the woman is jealous of man and God today. It's all going on, but we can't see it because we're very prideful and we are afraid to look at the truth. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask you a question, Jesse. Uh, then what is the purpose of woman, then, if God created woman and man? Yeah. Um, what is the purpose other than being man's God? In other words, in other words, what is the proper role for a woman to have in between a man and a woman, between child and yes. woman? Uh, in other uh, words, why did God make woman? Um, you know, uh, man, as I said earlier, man is supposed to love the truth more than he loved himself, mm -hmm. more than he loved the woman, more than he loved the world, more than he loved his children. And that truth, because we are, it's impossible for us to love on our own, right? But that truth that we're loving with is the love of God that dwells in us. And when we have that kind of truth, then the woman is subject to that truth, that love that's in us, which is of God. And so she comes together with man to be his helpmate, his helpmate, all right? Uh, she is there to have his children for him because that's how we create the family. She is there to watch over the children when, when the man is out of the home, when he's at work or when he's out doing what he's doing. She is to carry out uh, the order, orders that the father gives to her for the children, to direct the children's life. And his orders are coming from God. It's not the orders that he'll make it up of himself. She is there to uh, comfort him, make sure his house is in order, and the same with him. He's there to comfort her, to guide her in the right way, to be her God almost, but not a God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He's there to guide her, to, to keep her out of that hell that she's in, to bring her back to salvation. And that is his purpose. She is to be his helpmate, to love him as, as he loved God. Mm -hmm. But now in society, you know, with, with a lot of um, dysfunctional families and things like that, it's like a lot of women are single. Yes. And they're on their own. Yeah. So what should a woman do then? You know, the same God that dwells in man dwells in woman as well. He can dwell in her. Dwell in her. It's unfortunate that most women haven't had good fathers to guide them. So as a result of not having a good father, they hate men. And as a result of hating men, they're out there having sex out of wedlock. They have no respect for themselves. They're having children, you know, and just mean to the kids and patient and take away their identity. But if a woman should repent, God will forgive her as well. If she realizes that something is wrong in the way that she's operating, and she wants to let that go, lay down her pride and overcome it, he will also save her. And as a result of that, he would guide her in the same way he would me. The way that a father would, I mean, that a good dad guide, guides a child. Mm -hmm. He would guide her in the right way too, to go. But he would never put her over man. God won't change the order of things, but he will show her how to love her children, how to love herself, and how to love the world. It can work in her. She doesn't have to have a man to do it mm -hmm. because he will help her as well. Okay, thank right. you. Okay. Um, I think we have about two minutes left in the program. Uh, and, and, and wind it down. Again, pull away from the Bible. I'm telling you, as long as you're in that Bible, looking outside for the answer, you're not going to find it. As long as you're looking to the preacher, to interpret the Bible for you and tell you what it means, you're not going to find it. If a preacher go to, uh, is called by God, but he's going to school to be taught by someone else, he does not know God. You must be still and know God. All right. If you'd like more uh, uh, information about this or you want to be at our meetings, because in our meetings, I have more time within our meeting to answer questions. I love to take questions and I love for people to ask me about things because it allows me to give them the proper answer, guide them in the right way. You're not going to ever get that in your church, I guarantee you. You can't ask preachers anything. Uh, so you're welcome to the meeting. I invite all of you to come, men and women, every Sunday morning at 1030. And uh, the address is on the little thing on the TV there, so you can look for that. All right? 
Uh, are we out of time? Are we out of time? Oh, one minute. Um, you can only have one God. They say we have one minute. If the preacher is your God, you believe in, pre in the preacher, you don't believe in God. If you believe in your food, like I used to do, you don't believe in God. If you believe in your women, men, if you believe in a woman, you don't believe in God. If you believe in your drugs, if you believe in anything, you don't believe in God. The answer is within us. The kingdom of heaven is within us. And the only way that we're going to find the kingdom of heaven, we have to come out of our imagination and know that we are not God. We have to stop trying to remember. Stop trying to study the Bible to remember, all right? Because you will never, ever know him. We have all kind of information at our uh, office there, at our meeting place, uh, that will help you and guide you in the right way to go. Uh, I absolutely uh, promise you, I'm not God, so I can't give it to you. No man can give you salvation. But if you sit still, when you pray, oh yeah, let me say this real fast. When you pray, get up in the morning and just try this. I want you to go into your room and sit still and just close your eyes and become aware of your imagination. Stand back and look at your thoughts and let them go past and see what happens. I'll see you next time. Have a good night. Can find a way. I know we can find.